God is on the move. Amen. We're seeing signs of reformation, just a recent Supreme Court decision, 5-4, upholding the heartbeat law of Texas is a major sign of all the years we've been praying since 1973. 65 million babies have been aborted since 1973, and to see the Supreme Court uh, really make a shift that really is an indicator that they're, they're going to overturn Roe v. Wade. And that's why it's going to be overturned. How many of you believe it's going to be overturned? Amen. Yeah. I believe with all my heart. And, uh, but it goes to a state level at that point. So each state will have to determine. And, of course, your governor has declared that they want to be the number one abortion state. Well, with all due respect, this is very, very sad. But we have 40 million people in California. And California has been the number one abortion state since 73. What's so egregious is uh, Governor Newsom locked down everything. We were the worst lockdown state, worse than New York, worse than New Jersey. To just give you an indication how egregious it was, 49 states opened for some form of in-person worship service, whether it was something like just 10% of the congregation can meet or 100 or less. But we were locked down until we won the Supreme Court case in February of six, with a 6-3 decision. If we didn't win that, we would still be locked down past that date. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So it's a microcosmos of a macro problem in California. So Governor Newsom is saying, you know, we've got to save lives. It's all about data. It's about life. And I'm a pro-life governor. The hypocrisy of that. Yes, every life matters, and we do want to save lives with uh, COVID-19. has been tragic globally, especially globally. Over 2 million people have died. In California, around 50,000. But here's the point. We murder 200,000 babies every single year intentionally. And so that's why we need to see revival and reformation on a big scale. It's not just the governor's race, but on a state assembly, state senators, we have to get pro-life officials elected, and that's why I started this movement called One Race for Life uh, back in 2020. It's a new pro-life organization, and so you can check that out, One Race for Life, on the website. And what we're doing is basically what we do with the call prayer movement. How many of you heard of Blue Angle and the call? Okay. And so we gathered almost a half a million people by 12 o'clock on September 2nd, 2000. Uh, it was still the largest youth prayer gathering in the history of America. And we just came back from Let Us Worship on 9-11, and on the 12th, we gathered together, uh, but nothing like the call. How many of you were at the call, D.C.? Any of you? Okay, so that's amazing. A lot of you were. As far as I could say, there were people. And, um, and so during the time, at the peak of the call time, we asked the young people to make a pledge that they will never vote for a pro-abortion candidate in perpetuity. Now, we didn't ask them to sign anything. We just said, just before the Lord... Make a vow that you're going to vote pro-life. Well, you know, I believe that that shifted things because at that time, 37% of America was only pro-life based on Gallup poll. Today, it's 51%. Something has shifted in America. And believe it or not, the millennials and the young people are leading the way. Because of science and because of social media, they can just go and they can see. You, today, you could get a 3D sonogram. Now, I have eight grandchildren, and it's amazing how many of my, uh, my children wanted to get a 3D sonogram of their child in the womb. And when you look at it, it is a child. It's not a mass of tissues and cells. It's a human being. And so when they see that, they have access to information, and they begin to realize this has been a big lie. And, of course, the viability outside the womb uh, has uh, shortened, so people know that because they were just saying that you, you could abort until, you know, third term. Today, by the way, is late-term abortion. Even in Virginia, the governor of Virginia said, for whatever reason it was botched and the baby's born, you still have a right to kill the baby at the table. It is monstrous. It is madness. We have come to a time, and I shared this last time I was with you, of Isaiah 5.20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. So they're saying killing a baby is good because your rights as a woman is still being upheld. How crazy is that? Right. It's murder. Right. And of course, it's murder in the womb as well. 
And so this is something that I really believe that it is the number one social justice issue of our time. What was the civil rights of the 60s today, or what was the issue of slavery in the 1800s? And by the way, there was a bad Supreme Court decision called the Dred Scott decision of 1858 that said blacks were not humans. If the Supreme Court made a mistake back in 1858, they also made a mistake in 1973 with Roe v. Wade. We have to overturn that, and we have to, on a state-by-state level, have a culture of life. Can I hear an amen tonight? Anyway, thank you so much. It's been a long week for me. I just came back from uh, uh, Eric McTaxis' show this morning. I was up in New York, and uh, how many of you know who Eric McTaxis is? I, I want to encourage you, get a hold of his books. His book on Bonhoeffer, New York Times bestseller, millions have sold, uh, Amazing Grace, on the life of Wilberforce, William Wilberforce, the great reformer who entered the slave trade of 1807, trade, Slave Trade Act of um, England, and then in slavery in 1833 in Great Britain without firing one shot. We had to go through a civil war. But because he was a member of parliament, and because he was a king and he was on top of his mountain of government, he was able to transform England. And revival broke out, of course, called the Great Awakening of 1738, which impacted him. He came to know the Lord through that awakening under the Methodist uh, movement of John Wesley and Charles Wesley. And as a result of that, we see transformation taking place. And it wasn't just the whole issue of, of uh, ending slave trade, but he wanted to reform manners. And when we talk about manners, we're not talking about table manners. It was his way of saying we want to see morality back. We want to see purity before marriage, fidelity afterwards. Because you have to understand, back in the 1700s, before this revival broke out, it was called the gin age of Great Britain. What does that mean? Well, gin had been invented 40 years before the revival broke out. And prior to that time, people went to the bu- uh, bars, uh, the, bu- the bars, the pubs, and, and they would drink there. But it was only men who were allowed into the pubs. But when gin got invented, it became very cheap to make gin at home. You had a distillery at home. And because of the agricultural revolution, the grains were available. You could buy it so cheap, and then you would distill, make gin. And women became alcoholics overnight. This impacted women and children. Instead of going to the pubs, they just got drunk at home. And as a result of that, unemployment rates skyrocketed because no one can function. They couldn't work. Uh, Overnight, a nation became a nation of alcoholics. And then because of out of work, they still wanted to get drunk. They still wanted to buy gin. Crime rates soared. You could not walk through London without getting robbed. And then immorality, because there was no inhibition, they were having, people were having sex, fornication in Hyde Park in open day. This was what was going on before the Great Awakening broke out. But there's a revival principle I want to share with you. It's always the darkest time before the lighter revival breaks out. Let me say that again. It's always the darkest time before the lighter revival breaks out. And the scriptural basis for that is Isaiah 60, 1 through 5. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Darkness covers the earth, deep darkness over the people, but the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear before you, and nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawning. The point is, is that in these last days, we're going to see two parallel streams. You're going to see darkness and light. And I wish we could just say, yeah, we'll get rid of all darkness in this age, but the kingdom of God is here, but it's still increasing. It won't be completely light until Jesus Christ comes back. In Revelation 21, when he does come back, he creates a new heaven and a new earth. And, uh, but until then, the kingdom is advancing. Jesus comes on the scene, Matthew 4, 17, he says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Is what Daniel prophesied in Daniel chapter 2 when Nebuchadnezzar had the dream of this huge statue and then this rock coming and destroying the statue and, and the statue becoming fine dust and the wind blowing the dust and that rock grows and grows becomes a huge mountain. And Daniel prophesies 
That statue is very his kingdom. The, the gold head is you, Nebuchadnezzar. Babylon, rich, powerful. The second kingdom that's going to come is inferior. That's why the silver chest, the Persians, the Medes. And then the bronze waves represents the Greeks that are going to come. And then after that, the Romans, because it was represented by iron legs, and that's what the Romans use, iron, to make swords and shields and to, to just destroy and conquer. But during the Roman Empire, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. Yeah. Fullness of time. In the perfect time, how many know God is sovereign? Can I hear an amen? Yeah. And he's sovereign over your life. You're here by divine appointment. Because Psalm 37, 23 says, the steps of a righteous man and woman are ordered by you. Elizabeth, you're here by divine appointment at this time. It's not a coincidence. Do you believe that or do you think? No, we don't believe that. By the way, I want to introduce uh, my spiritual son, Evie. Everyone just stand up and he's with me. And first time here at King of Kings Church. And uh, he's the Lord, uh, he's, he's a powerful attorney, so if you need some law and legal help, you know, he could help you out. And so, and so we, uh, we've been uh, traveling, we came for Let Us Worship uh, event, it was a powerful event. We had amazing speakers, Josh Howley, Senator Howley, uh, Eric McTaxis, and uh, Frank, Jensen Franklin, and others. Anyway, it was just a great time uh, to be there to really pray for America. It was really a solemn assembly because on the 20th anniversary, you talk about sovereignty. You know, they wanted to get a weekend, any weekend, uh, for Let Us Worship. Let Us Worship, for those who don't know, was founded by Sean Foyt. Sean, I've known him since he was 16. And he's one of the worship leaders at Bethel in Reading. And uh, so the Lord called him to run for Congress, which gave him a tremendous amount of visibility. U.S. Congress, he lost in the Reading area. But that catapulted him to do these outdoor during the pandemic when everything was locked down. And by the way, when he went to Huntington Beach, it was illegal to gather in the beach. Again, California was so draconian in the oppression of locking people down that you couldn't even gather outdoors. I mean, where's the science for that? You know, the beach outdoors, you know, but you couldn't gather outdoors and worship. But he did it anyway. It's time for us to take a stand. Can I hear an amen? amen? We need to take a stand on our constitutional rights, to the rights to gather, to assemble, free speech. That's all in the First Amendment. It doesn't say it has to be in a building. It says it could be outdoors. It could be in some church building, in a home. And uh, thousands of people showed up to his prayer. I think people, in, people have a sense of what's right and what's wrong, and they know and they can smell freedom. And so when they saw the, all these young people gathering together, and the thing that really encourages me about these gatherings, we're talking about their teenagers. Amen. It's not my generation, it's not my children's generation, it's my children's kids' generation that are gathering together. It's like another Jesus people movement. In fact, so many people got saved, they just baptized them in the Pacific Ocean right after that. Many of you saw that on YouTube. It was powerful. They have now gone to 133 cities. Thousands have gathered. This is a sign that we're on the verge of another revival and the harvest of God is coming in. It is another sign. I think the Supreme Court decision, our Supreme Court decision, and the one that they weighed in, in about Texas is also a sign that God is on the move. And so anyway, um, what I wanted to say is the light and darkness are going to parallel together. And so you see the darkness, the great awakening, and then the light suddenly, 1738, on New Year's Eve, the Holy Spirit fell upon a handful of these uh, radical lovers of Jesus as they were praying for the new year on New Year's Eve. And Charles Wesley, John Wesley, George Whitfield was part of that group. And the Spirit of God fell upon them, and they had to pray. When was the last time you prayed this? God, lift your hand, because I'm going to die because of your presence. But that's what they experienced. And the revival was on. Whitfield, as a 21-year-old, he goes to Bristol, begins to open air preach with the, to the coal miners who are getting off of work. These miners never went to church. 
Not because they weren't members of a parish, because they divided everyone up into some kind of parish with the Anglican Church. But they, they didn't feel worthy to walk into a church building because they were full of cold dust 24-7. They took a bath only once a week and wasn't to go to church. And so they didn't have the proper clothes. They, so Whitfield knew this, so he said, I'm going to go to them, and he started to open air preach. A thousand started to gather. We're talking about up to 20,000 people gathered together. And John Wesley, when he took over Whitfield, because Whitfield was invited to the United States and asked John to take over the open air preaching, John records in his prayer journal, you can see the tears washing the cold dust from the people's face as they were weeping before the Lord. People were falling under the power of the Holy Spirit. People were laughing, holy laughter. He didn't understand that, but he recorded People were laughing ecstatically. Amen. By the way, there's no new manifestation under the sun. When the Holy Spirit comes, how many know the Holy Spirit can do whatever yeah. he wants to do? Yeah. You know, a lot of times we judge the manifestation. We say that's of the flesh. But I think God is more concerned about our religious spirit, our pharisaical attitude towards any kind of revival. Right. Right. And of course, John Wesley himself was convicted of this. Because he began to pray, God, give me revival without the mess, because he was seeing so much manifestation. <laughs> give me revival without the mess, but if I have to have the mess, give me revival. I don't care. At the end of the day, I want revival. And that's a great, great theological conviction to have. And so we see the darkness and light. We saw it in 1948, uh, the tremendous light of the latter rain revival. The latter rain of North Battleford, Canada. 1948, the revival called the Hebrides Revival broke out off a set of islands in Scotland. But what was the dark period? The dark period was from 39 to 45 called World War II. 80 million people died in that war. Most of them were civilian. 80% of the 80 million were civilians. And of course, we, we were part of that, right? The United States. Every nation was involved in World War II. Only eight nations declared themselves to be neutral. And the damage done, I mean, I, we have around 150 churches in Russia. And whenever I go there, the trauma they have experienced from World War II still lingers. Because you pick up an orphan nation. So many of the men died in World War II. And the next generation of men were so traumatized by it because vodka is one, one ruble, is like one dollar, is cheaper than, cheaper than beer in Russia. And so the men became alcoholics, the next generation. And as a result of that, they were absent with their kids. And so you see the curse of, of uh, that orphan spirit. By the way, the word orphan in the Hebrew, yatem, means fatherlessness. You could have a mom, but in the Bible, you're considered an orphan if you don't have a dad. That's how important dads are. Amen. Yeah. And I've met pastors who don't have fingers. They don't even have a nose. What happened is that they were alcoholics before they gave their lives to Jesus Christ. And in that cold Siberian weather, they got frostbite. And their limbs just fell off. They didn't take care of themselves. They didn't even care. They were so numb by their, the alcohol in their body. I mean, when you literally, so many of them, when you shake their hand, they don't have fingers. It wasn't just one or two. It was just almost a whole nation became a nation of alcoholics. But God. 1989, the Holy Spirit began to move in Russia because the Iron Curtains fell. And a tremendous church planning took place. And all these churches start to spring up and still going on right now. By the way, I'm getting reports during this COVID, revival is breaking out in Russia. Amen. You may not know this, but right now we're experiencing a global harvest that, according to Dave Barrett's encyclopedia and their ministry, even though he passed away, his ministry is continuing to record the growth of Christianity around the world. 200,000 people are getting saved every single day, every day globally. 35,000 every day in China, 35,000 every day in India. Brazil has been really hit with COVID, but it's just, it's just unbelievable the growth of the church in Brazil. Amen. Indonesia, the largest Muslim nation, 
40% of Indonesia is now born again. Amen. We're seeing a million Muslims getting saved every year. And so, you know, we look at it, we just get bad news when we watch television. No one reports about the good news that God's doing around the world. But this is just a beginning. I want to just submit to you, it's just a beginning. Because with World War II, it was so devastating, then we see some of the greatest revivals break out. I'm talking about Billy Graham in 49. I'm talking about Campus Crusade in 48. We're talking about the voice of healing, Ora Roberts and T.L. Osborne, and some of the great healing evangelists. We're talking about the charismatic renewal in 1958. Jesus' people movement in 67. And so what we're going through right now is a dark time. But I want to submit to you, we're on the verge of the greatest revival in the history of the church. I'm talking about a billion soul harvest that's coming in. But here's what I want to share. Here's my text, and I really want to spend the next 20 minutes uh, sharing this, maybe even less, because then I want, to, I want to pray for you. How many of you have been to Israel? Okay, so half of you have not. Let me encourage you, save up your money and go to Israel at least one time in your life. Make a pilgrimage. Um, by the way, HIM, we, we do a trip to Israel every year. I've been to Israel over a dozen times as a result of that. Uh, of course, we didn't go with COVID. In fact, we were going to do it again this weekend. Uh, and we had 30 people signed up. And, uh, and then the government just locked us down again because it's crazy. Israel, and th- this is a side point, but let me just share the side point. Can I share this side point? <laughs> 80% of Israel is vaccinated, but there is an outbreak of COVID taking place. Where's the science behind that? Someone explain that to me. Everyone's vaccinated, and that's what Biden wants to do, mandate 80 million people getting vaccinated, and still the pandemic won't be cured as a result. God's natural way, and I hate to say it this way, is that some of you will get COVID. And, and now, in our church, we mitigated. We told our high-risk people, uh, or those who are elderly, watch online, don't come to the service. But we told our young people to come. And we've not had one outbreak of COVID, by the way. People have gotten COVID, but it's at work or with their family, friends. But if they do, they've all recovered. And they get their natural antibodies. As a result of that, that's what God's designed for us to fight any kind of virus throughout history. But, you know, we're now just putting everything on the vaccination. And, um, and of course, uh, my, our, our, in our church, we just say, listen, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you want to get vaccinated, go for it. There's no condemnation. There's no shame of that. But if you don't want to get, there's no condemnation for not getting it either. And we're not going to shame you for not getting vaccinated. It's between you and God and your physician. Can I hear an amen? And so we need to have that kind of freedom that adults hear from God. And we just, same thing with masks. We don't care if you wear masks or not. But don't shame anyone who does or who doesn't. Let them just hear before God and do what they feel is right. And again, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is Exactly. Amen. So that's what we want. And our nation's value of liberty is based on 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 18 and 19. So what I want to talk about, though, is when Jesus takes his disciples to Caesarea Philippi in Matthew chapter 16. And so if you've been to Israel, you'll know where Caesarea Philippi is. There's two Caesareas. There's one Caesarea by the sea. And which is very interesting, that's where Cornelius gets saved. And when you go to Caesarea by the sea, the archaeologists have dug up that whole city, and it's like a miniature Rome. You have a Hippodome with the chair of grace. You have the Colosseum. All the buildings are just like Rome. It's like a miniature Rome. Why? Because the apostle's job, and Pontius Pilate was an apostle. The Roman Empire, the emperor sent apostles there were either a governor, a general, or an admiral to uphold the Roman law in the conquered territory as well as bring Roman culture to the conquered territory. They were called apostles. The word apostle simply means sent out once, apostolos, sent out once. And, and so when Jesus said to his disciples in, in Luke chapter 6, 13, he comes down from the mountain, verse 12, he calls them together. 
And out of thousands, for this is early in his ministry, thousands were following him. He picks 12, and he calls them apostles. Yes. Now, my, my opinion, my, uh, and this is my opinion, I think they were offended by that. If he had said, you're my priest, they would have gotten that, because throughout Israel's history, you have the Levites, you have a, a tribe of priests, they were ministers, and if he said, you're my priest, it's going to be a new wineskin of priests, I think they would have been really honored. Or if he had said, you're my prophets, wow, because you're talking about the highest spiritual authority in Israel in the Old Testament was the, was the prophet, not the king, but the prophet. It was Samuel the prophet that anointed Saul to be king. It was Samuel who took the kingship from Saul and gave it to David. So it, the authority structure in the Old Testament is prophet, then king, and then priest. In the New Testament, it's apostle, prophet, and then the pastor teacher. Based on 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. All right? So it's different in the New Testament. But when he says apostles initially... They were offended because they hated apostles. They hated Pontius Pilate. They hated anyone from Rome because they were the oppressors. They couldn't wait till Jesus overthrew the Roman kingdom. Are you at this time going to establish your kingdom even after the resurrection during the 40-day period? They're asking the same question they asked in the beginning. They just didn't understand it's a spiritual kingdom. It's not a physical, geopolitical kingdom. The kingdom of God's within you. He's ruling and reigning in your heart. But what Jesus did, he intentionally picked a secular word that's not even in the Old Testament. You can't find the word apostolos in the Old Testament. He picked a word because he also has a kingdom. He also has a kingdom culture. He also has kingdom laws. And he says, I'm calling you to establish kingdom culture and kingdom laws wherever you go. I want you to disciple nations. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so that word apostolos, he sanctified it, he, he uh, restored it into the kind of prominence that they would understand eventually. It's taken us 2,000 years, but we're still trying to understand that, what it means to make disciples of a nation. Well, in the same way, he does the same thing with the word ecclesia. So he goes to Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi is the northern part of the geography of Israel. It's just lush there because that's where the rain comes. Mount Hermon's up there. And even Psalm 1 and 3 says, as the, the rain comes down Mount Hermon to the mountains of Zion. And that's where the Jordan River starts. And so when you go up there, it's a three-day walk by bus, maybe around two-hour drive. It's, you're like you're in a different country. It is so beautiful, so lush. And then at the beginning of where the Jordan River starts and flows, there's this huge mountain and big cave. And inside the cave, there's a natural boulder. It's a huge boulder. And that cave is called the Gates of Hell. It's been called the Gates of Hell for, for centuries. And the reason why, according to those who have studied ancient history, the Moabites that used to occupy that area used that, that boulder for human sacrifice. And you can't get more evil than sacrificing a human life. That's why abortion is absolutely demonic and is evil. It's the evil uh, manifestation of injustice of our time. There's nothing worse than killing lives. And you say, say well, slave, enslaving people, but you're still alive. When we take a life, it's evil. That's why communism is an evil ideology. Amen. The Communist Party, just take Mao, take Kim, Il, uh, Kim Il-sung, the founder of the Communist Party in North Korea, and Stalin, they killed over 100 million of their own people. Not in war. They starved them. They sent them to concentration camps. They just killed innocent people. That's what communism would do because it's an atheistic ideology. When you take God out of the equation, then people are not made in the image and likeness of God. So we could take their life. Life is cheap. 
But once we have a biblical understanding that we're made in the image and likeness of God, that we're fearfully, wonderfully made, Psalm 138, then all of a sudden, life matters. Every life matters. And so that's why we got to have this biblical view and value of life and have a culture of life beginning in the church and in the home. So he takes them there and he asks them this question to the disciples, who do men say that I am? Oh, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're John the Baptist. Then he turns to Peter, who do you say that I am? And he says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. You're not that smart. (laughs) You didn't get this because of your brilliance. My father revealed this to you. And on this rock, I will build my ecclesia, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. A lot of people think it's Peter, but Peter is translated Petra, I mean Petros, Petros. And when he says on this rock, it's a different Greek word, it's Petra, and it means a giant boulder. It's like the rock of Gibraltar. It's not talking about Peter. Unfortunately, the Catholic Church thinks that Peter is the rock of the church, and we have apostolic succession, and the popes that followed are those who are to succeed Peter. No, it's a revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. On this rock, I'll build my church. I will build my ecclesia. Now, this is important. I know you pronounce it ecclesia, and people can pronounce it either way. I pronounce it ecclesia because it comes from two Greek words, ek, out, Kaleo called. It's called out ones. You're called out. And so this word was coined 350 years before Jesus was born in Athens. Now, Athens was a city state and it was a philosophical city. This is where all the philosophers came out of Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. And Aristotle wrote about the Ecclesia because if you're part of the citizens of Athens, you were citizens, by the way, citizens were only men qualified for it, no women, and you have to be 21 years old. Thank God for the gospel of Jesus Christ that brings liberty and equality to everyone, amen? You know, but anyway, that was the time. We're talking about hundreds of years even before Christ, so we're talking about 2,300 years ago. And, um, and they realized that they needed a governing body to decide whether they would go to war or not, to, to, to uh, uh, be judges over criminal cases, um, to, to establish justice in, in a given city. God established government for justice purposes in any nation. And so they formed a governing body and they called them ecclesia because they were called out of the citizens, called out once, and that became the ecclesia. So when Jesus says, I'm going to build my ecclesia. Now, I, I need to back up here. Now, if he said, I'm going to build my synagogue, they would have understood that. Because what we experience even tonight is very much like a synagogue service. But he didn't say that. And the other thing I want to say is that people talk about, well, we as a church shouldn't be involved in politics. We shouldn't be involved in government then why did Jesus pick the word ecclesia? It was a governing body. He took a word that's not in the Old Testament. I mean, there were a few times in the Septuagint, which is the Greek Old Testament, but, but it's not a word that was used by the Jewish people for worship, it was synagogue. He says, I'm going to build my ecclesia, called out ones out of the whole body of Christ, out of this, this world's system, you're going to be the ones who are going to be the head and not the tail. You're the ones that are going to be the governing body. Yes. Now, this is important because he gives us authority to back this up. The next verse, I mean, this is in Matthew 16, 18. I will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell will not prevail against. By the way, the gates of hell, he was pointing right at that cave. No matter how evil society is, including murder and child sacrifice. It's not going to overcome the church. The church wins. The kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he's going to reign forever and ever. We win. 
No matter how difficult things are for you, I want you to have this peace in your heart and faith and confidence. We win. Everything's good. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And we're seated with him in heavenly places. Far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion. Ephesians 2, 20, 21. So you're seated with him in the heavenly places. Above, you have authority over the principalities and powers. Why? Because when Jesus went to the cross, he didn't just die for our sins, which we thank God for. But the Bible says something interesting. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. He disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public display of them. In Revelation 1, he took the keys of death and Hades. He rose again. In Matthew 28, verse 18, he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. That's in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. But in Matthew 16, going back to Matthew 16, he says, I'm going to build my ecclesia and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He says in the next verse, verse um, uh, 19, he says, I give you the keys of the kingdom. What are keys? What do they represent? They are exactly authority. When you buy a house, they give you the key. You're the one in authority. You own that house. Or the car. When we bought our building, our church building, 2004. By the way, God's going to give you a great building. This is great, but he's going to give you. It may be this. Because God wants to give you property. In fact, all of you, I want you to claim property. Because when you have property, you have authority. I know it seems difficult in the New Jersey, New, New York area. But I, I, I told my people, if you hang around with me long enough, I, I promise you, you're going to own a home in California. Because I want to build your faith so that you could, because I believe that God's given me grace to buy property. And we, we bought five homes in Los Angeles. On paper, I'm a multi, multi-millionaire because they've appreciated so much. Peter Rizzelli helped me, by the way. He helped me invest. And, and, um, and then we bought... I, of course, I was going to do that. It's not for me. I did this for my children so they all could have a home. Yeah, well, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, and the wealth of the unrighteous are stored for the righteous, right? I think that's Proverbs 13, 20. You need to claim that. You need to claim that for yourself. God wants to bless you so much. But he wants... He has given you authority. That's the point I'm trying to say. He's given it. It's already a done deal. He's given you authority. I've given you authority. Luke 10, 19, to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing will hurt you. But here's the problem. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Isaiah 4, 6. We don't know who we are. You know, we're just, if I could just say, the church has been just, just so lukewarm. You know, even though we have all authority, the authority of Jesus Christ, what a powerful name it is. You know, we're talking about power, we're talking about authority, and yet we just feel like, you know, beam me up, Scotty, I just can't wait to the rapture, everything's going to get worse and worse, and why even bother to even be engaged when he's called you to be the ecclesia? You're the hope, you represent Jesus here on earth. You represent. When he says in John 16, verse 8, he says, it's true, or vanish thy go away. When you hear that, when you read that, you say, what in the heck is he talking about? He's Jesus Christ. He's God himself. How will his disappearance help us to be better off? Because I'm going to send the helper, the Holy Spirit. But here's the point. The Holy Spirit's within you. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3, 6, and don't you know you're the temple of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit, God himself, dwells within you? It's Colossians 1, 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You are carriers of the glory of God. And so we are the answer to the world's yeah. problem. Amen. And so God is saying it's time to wake up as a church. Amen. I've given you so much authority. And so now we're seeing by God's grace, I feel like for the first time, the church is starting to wake up in California. I mean that I've been there since 1984, and for the first time it's taken a lot of disappointments, you know, and discouragement, and just going through 
different seasons. And God uses all that for the good. You know, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him. But even after the election laws, which my opinion was stolen, and so we're just so discouraged over that. But out of that, God raised up Revive California. And Revive California is 15 apostles. I'm talking about true apostles. I'm talking about the Bill Johnsons and Sammy Rodriguez and Dave Diaz and John Jackson, the president of William Jessup University. We're talking about in different mountains that made a covenant by sacrifice that we're going to see revival and reformation in California. And I'd like to encourage Peter to start that in New Jersey. That when apostles come together with the authority God's given to apostles, it shifts everything. And that's why he says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. That's the kind of authority I've given to you. By the way, the way it reads in the Greek is whatever you bind must first have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose must first have been loosed in heaven. What does that mean? It means heaven initiates. The key to binding and loosening is you got to hear from God. That's why apostles and prophets work together. Prophets have an unusual ability to hear from God, but apostles have unusual authority to make it happen. Now, we all have authority, but there are different levels and measures and spheres of authority. And so in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, which I quoted, it says, first apostles, that word first, Greek word is proton, second, deuteron, third, triton. And you look up that word in the Greek lexicon, it means first in authority. So now in the New Testament, it's not the prophet and then the king and the priest. It's apostles first, second, prophets, third, the pastor teacher. And so that's why it's so important to be apostolically aligned. Because your authority is going to rise as your apostle come forth. And I want to make the announcement, and I know he's already been commissioned, but, but um, we're going to be commissioning your pastor, Peter and Trish, at the Global Summit as apostles and prophet at our Global Summit. We do that once a year uh, in Pasadena. And so it's just recognizing what God's already done.